in every step, in every stride, I will let the Savior be my guide. Let him be my guide. His word, his love, I will embrace. And let his wisdom set the pace. We must feed on the bread of life ourselves before we can serve it to others. When the Bible speaks, discussion is useless. When the Bible is silent, discussion ends. Therefore, study the Bible to be wise. Believe it to be safe. Practice it to be holy. Our topic tonight is how to build up life and future. How can we build up our life and our future? This is a question which many people have been asking. You have a vision. You have a mission. But how can you accomplish this? Yes, by the strength and the grace of God. But how do we tap from the strength and grace of God when we have chosen to live like the people in the world instead of people of the kingdom? Life is full of misleading voices, wrong voices, wrong directions, and human wills. There are many people whose wills have not been broken. That's why they can always charge up. I will do what I want to do. I will do what I choose to do. Nobody should tell me what to do. That is human will, not God's will. If your life has been in this line, then there is a cause for you to be extremely careful to what kind of voice you are hearing, to what kind of direction you are following. We must always make sure that we follow correctly and strictly God's command to our lives. Only what God has intended for us shall we embrace. Only what God has spoken to us shall we hear. Many times we claim that we are doing the will of God just because we have chosen to follow human intentions. Just because we have chosen to follow all that we desire to do, not what God wants us to do. We are going to divide this topic into three divisions. First, how to know and determine divine assignment, what God has assigned upon your life. Two, how to stay focused and concentrated to divine direction. Thirdly, how to fulfill the cause of our lives. How can we fulfill that? Whatever God has intended for us. Now, so we start in the beginning, the first one. How to know and determine divine assignment. Many people today misunderstand between vision and ambition. <clears throat> if you want to determine divine assignment of God upon your life, you must be able to differentiate between vision and ambition. Vision is what you are created to do or pursue on this planet Earth. While ambition is what you want to do or what you want to be. You must always remember this. You cannot be able to fulfill the divine assignment of God upon your life until you are able to differentiate between vision and ambition. Be vision is what you are created, what God has assigned upon your life to accomplish on this planet earth. While ambition is what you want to be or what you choose to do. For instance, in the book of John chapter 21, verse 3 through 6, the Bible told us concerning Simon Peter. God had chosen him, the Lord Jesus chose him to be fishers of men. But after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, Peter went back to pursue his own ambition. Look at what the Bible says there in the book of John Gospel, chapter 21, verse 3 through 6. 
Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciple did not know that it was him. It was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast and they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Let's stop the moment. It see the difference between vision and ambition. Vision God gave him through our Lord Jesus Christ was, I will make you fishers of men and no more fishers of fish. But after the crucifixion, Peter thought that, well, it's all over. All that we've been following Jesus, our Lord and Savior has been crucified, he's dead. He forgot all that the Lord Jesus told him about resurrection and went to pursue his ambition. This is what you see today in many people's life. We all would pursue our own thing, thinking that, well, there's nothing else to do instead of pursuing our vision. A divine assignment or commission is God's instruction or God's voice to accomplish a particular thing on the planet Earth. Which means God has instructed you on what to do. God has chosen you for a task and instructed you on what to do. Just as what he told to Moses. Now we saw what happened to Peter. Peter who was chosen, who was pursuing his own ambition. But look at the book of Exodus a moment. Chapter 24. Exodus chapter 24. Look at verse 12 through 18. We're going to... We're not going to read all, but we'll just read a few verses there. Exodus 24, 12 through 18 at your time. Then the Lord said to Moses, come up to the mountain, come up to me on the mountain and be there. And I will give you tablets of stone and the law and commandment which I have written that you may teach them. So Moses arose with his assistant Joshua and Moses went up to the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, wait here for us until we come back to you. Indeed, Aaron and who are with you. If any man has difficulty, let him go to them. Then Moses went up into the mountain and a cloud covered the mountain. Now you see, here this is a vision which God has given to Moses. God told Moses to come up to the mountain to do what? To receive the tablet of law so that Moses will be able to teach the Israelites on God's law. Because the law came by Moses. But grace and mercy come by our Lord Jesus Christ. As you read in the book of John chapter 1. So you see the vision God gave to Moses. A divine instruction. Instructing on what to do. And he pursued that. He pursued it. You cannot build up your life or future unless you're able to differentiate between ambition and vision. Because every one of us has ambition to do something. I want to be like this. I want to do this. I want to. But is that the calling of God upon your life? That's a question. Divine commission or instruction is known by God. And God himself will always back it up. Regardless of the opposition force. Regardless of that. Whatever God has assigned upon your life. If you remain faithful, God will back you up regardless of the powers and forces of opposition to it. Because every good thing will come under attack. They will try to subdue you, try to put in bondage, try to put in captivity so that you are not able to accomplish what God has designed because he knew that when you obey the will of God, that very accomplishment of divine instruction will have a great impact in his kingdom, in the kingdom of devil. You are going to plunder it and populate heaven. That's what in the book of Job chapter 8, a moment. Job chapter 8. Look at verse 7, it says. Job chapter 8. In verse 7, it says. Though your beginning was small, yet your later end will increase abundantly. Many times, just because you are attacked by the enemy concerning the divine instruction that you received from God. It seems your beginning is so small. It seems that you are not making any headway. And people begin to laugh at you. You see, 
Nobody is there. You see, they're all living. You see, your end will be more than your beginning. If you remain faithful. The peace of God that supports all understanding is what will give you the needed assurance that God is with you in your divine assignment. It is the peace of God. It is not the peace of man. It's not because you are strong enough to fight the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. And many times people ask, how come is she still there? How come is she still functioning? How come is she continue moving on? Because you know you are God. Because you know God will not fail you. The Bible declared and said, those who know their God will be strong and do great exploit. Because you know you are God. Because you know, as Apostle Paul wrote to, to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, he said, for I am persuaded that what I have committed into his hands, he will keep it against that day. That is what moves you on. Now I'm going to show you an example about a man who was given a vision. And eventually he was attacked. Turn your Bible a moment in the book of Nehemiah. Glory to Jesus. After this, you're not going to allow devil to make you as if you have no heavenly father. You're not going to allow him to kick you up and down. In the book of Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4, look at verse 1 through 5. But so it happened when Sambalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and very indignant, and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria, and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? We they complete it in a day? We they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? Now, Tobiah, the Ammonite, was beside him, and he said, Whatever they build, if even a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. You see what they said? Now, let's stop a moment. This is the divine instruction given to the man called Nehemiah, who was in the king's palace as a cupbearer and had that vision to go and do something for the wall of Jerusalem which had been burned down. If you remember how he started this very journey, the Bible said in the book of Nehemiah chapter 1 that when he saw the remnant of the people, he asked them what has happened in Jerusalem, how are the people who were left there? And they told him that there was a great hardship and the walls of Jerusalem had been burned down. Things are ruined. Things are not working. The Bible said in verse 4 of Nehemiah chapter 1, when he heard this news, oh, men of prayer, like him, when he heard this news, he did four things. He cried, he mourned, he fasted, and he prayed. Can we have such men today? When you hear news about somebody, maybe the person is going to die because of sickness or disease, or maybe the doctor has given that person a few days to go. What do you do? Or maybe somebody has lost his, his or her job. What do you do? You just say, well, that's not my business. That's their business. I don't care about it. Or do you remember what this man of God in the Bible, who saw the face of God in prayer on behalf of others? What do you do? Or maybe you call the person that time and pray with that person, does it? Do you continue in prayer throughout the night? And say, Lord, prove that you are God. Lord, stretch out your hand and perform miracle. When I remember the prayer of God's servants in the book of Acts chapter 4, when they were persecuted and told not to speak in the name of Jesus, that they don't want, nobody should preach in that name. What did they do? They lifted up their voices and cried and prayed and said, Lord God, stretch out your hand in the name of your Holy Son and perform miracle. Will you do that? When you hear that news, you reach out and begin to pray and say, Lord, perform a miracle. Let it be a miracle. Change the heart of man. I always tell people this. The heart of man is in the hands of God and God turns it as he turns for water. Nothing is impossible with God. He can change every situation you are, every circumstance. If you only believe and know him, when you know him, you shall be strong. 
So here the assignment that was given to this man called Nehemiah was attacked. Tobias and Ammon, the Ammonites, all of them co conspired together to stop that work, to make sure that nothing worked. The same thing you see today in the ministry. Many people conspire to try to stop a church or try to break up churches or try to bring down a man or woman of God. But I tell you the truth, no one will bring you down. No one will bring me down except you or except myself. You don't bother about what people say. Press on with God. Live right. Pursue the course of the calling of God upon your life. Apostle Paul said, I do not consider the past, but I press on to the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now look at verse 4. What did they do when they were attacked? When the vision was to be stopped by those who are not happy about God's work. They lifted up their voice. Look at what they said. Hear, our, hear O our God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads and give them as plunders to a land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity and do not let their sin be blotted out from before you. For they have provoked you to anger before the builders. See, they prayed. At the time in verse 7, the same thing happened. Now it happened when Sambala, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and their gaps were beginning to be closed, that they become very angry. And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Nevertheless, we made our prayers to our God. And because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. Look at that. You see what enemy can do to stop the vision of God upon your life? You see what the enemy can do in order to subdue, try to subdue you? They conspired. Try to stop the work of God. They conspired. Try to make people to be frustrated. They say, let's go and confuse them. Let's go and sow seed of confusion. Let's go and parade and spread lies. But they made their prayer unto God. That is what we need to do in our own life. In executing God's assignment upon our lives, we must be able to stand head on with the devil without fear. I always encourage people to do this. When you are fighting this spiritual warfare, you must remember that the warfare you're fighting is not warfare with man, it's with unseen forces. You must stand your ground. You must prove what made you to be a child of God. You must stand against all onslaught of the devil and all his agents with the victory which Jesus has given to you and I. We must be able to stand against demonic conspiracies and smile at the storm. This is something we must learn to do. You see what happened in that portion of the scripture in the book of Nehemiah? They say, let's go and sow this confusion. Let's go attack them. People can begin to spread lies against you. They can begin to speak evil just to do what to put fears in the heart of others. But you must know who called you. Man did not call you. Woman didn't call you. No denomination called you. Almighty God called you. You must stand your ground and press on and say, I know my Redeemer lives. You can't stand to say that without being a man or woman of prayer. You cannot smile at the storm unless you know how to put your knees down. A man or woman who puts his knees down is able to stand against all odds. Any situation, you stand strong and know your Redeemer lives. Divine commission or divine assignment comes from constant instructions from the Lord. Of course, today you hear people say, the Lord told me, the Lord told me, but actually the Lord never opened his mouth. They are telling themselves. They are trying to impress you that they hear from God, but they did not hear from God. You can see men and women who hear from God don't always say the Lord told me. They will not say. Because they know that they hear from God. There's no need to try to say that in order to justify whatever they have to say. That's why in the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, look at verse 18. But a part of the just is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. Yes. If you're a person 
who stands for God, you continue to shine. You continue to shine because you receive instruction from God. And the same thing God spoke through Isaiah the prophet when he said, I will go before you and make all crooked ways straight. I will give you hidden treasures of darkness. He will remove every impediment that tries to stop your progress because God has commissioned you to do that. Secondly, how to keep focused and concentrated to divine direction. When God has called you and wants you to build up your future and your life, all we need to do is to learn how to keep focus on God. Don't easily get distracted. I tell you this as a secret. Many times, people of God are being distracted just because of what people say about them, just because of what people, the actions of people, just because they feel hurt and wounded, they say, I, I don't want to go anymore. You forget to know these are nothing but forces of destruction. When we want to build up our life and also future, we must learn how to keep focus on God. We can keep focus to divine direction by maintaining what? Commitment, total commitment. The first thing is total commitment. You must be totally committed to the course of what God has set you in. Total commitment. And remember, there will never be a relationship with God without commitment. And there will be no commitment without time investment. You must learn to invest your time with God. This is what you must know. In the book of Colossians chapter 4 verse 17, the Bible made it clear. When Apostle Paul was writing, he made it clear, say, hold on to the ministry. I'd like to take you there. In the book of Colossians chapter 4, look at verse 17. And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. He said, here, for you to fulfill that very divine instruction God has given to you, you need to focus on God. And in order to focus, you must maintain a total commitment. And that total commitment is what we say, say hold on. Take heed. Be careful with that very calling. Many of us are not careful with our callings. Many of us are not careful with what we are instructed by God to do. We are not. Because we are a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit. It's time for us to focus. Here, he said, Take heed to the calling of God upon your life. And in the book of 2 Timothy, Apostle Paul made it clear in a way that we shall understand how to remain focused on God. In chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse 1 through 5. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Fantastic. You see, the next thing we saw is be strong in the grace. The grace that God has poured upon you, be strong in it. What is that grace? The unmerited favor. Be strong in it. In verse 2, And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit this to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of, of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. So you, what is the rule? You must endure to the end. It is not how you started it. It is how you, end, how you ended it. That's what matters. Even in the, if, if you go for, 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 to participate in sports, let's assume you want to go on 100-meter dash. It's not how you started it, it is, did you end it well? If you start and run halfway and fall, you're gone. So it is how you ended it. So that's why commitment is very important here as we move with God. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 22, in verse 29, Proverbs 22, 29, it says, do you see a man who excels in his work? He will stand before the kings. He will not stand before unknown men. Yes. When you are totally committed to what God has for you and move on with it, never allowing Satan to deceive you, you will have a crown. You will stand with before the kings. You will receive a crown. 
You will not stand before the unknown men, but you always stand with prominent people. That is why it's important to hold on to what God has entrusted in your hand. Secondly, we can keep focus and concentrate in the divine direction by being totally involved with the vision. You must always be totally involved with the vision that God has given to you. Many of us easily lose our sight. We easily, easily lose our vision. Remember, your vision is your mission. Don't allow your vision to become something else. That's the mission. And the vision is the eye that takes you from where you are to next level of achievement or accomplishment. So you must learn to be totally involved with that vision. Totally involved. Not moving forward, one step forward, three steps backwards. You must get involved with that. Thirdly, we must also maintain endurance and long-suffering with patience. For you to remain focused in that particular thing that God has called you to do, you must always maintain long-suffering and patience. Why? When the Hebrew writer wrote in the book of Hebrew, chapter 10, a moment, Hebrew chapter 10, look at verses 35 and 36. It says, Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. We need endurance, long-suffering. Many of us cannot move forward because we don't have patience. I always say, it, if you are not patient, you become a patient. You must learn to be patient. You must learn how to exercise your patience. Many of us, we are easily bored, easily weary. Because we cannot move forward. We feel that enough is enough. But that's not the way it should be. We must learn to exercise patience so that we can move forward. Next, for us to keep focused, we must exercise wisdom and prudence. Wisdom and prudence. See, for you to remain focused, you must learn how to be wise, not to be distracted. Because when you exercise wisdom, you will know when the enemy comes like a, a roaring lion, and you can resist him. The Bible told us in the book of Proverbs chapter 4, very clearly said in verse 7, Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. And in chapter 20, 24 of Proverbs, something is spoken there that can help us also. In the book of Proverbs 24, verse 3 through 6. It says, through wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. By knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. A wise man is strong, yes, a man of knowledge increases strength. For by wise counsel you will wage your own war, and in a multitude of counselors there is safety. This is something we must learn. For you to remain focused, you need wisdom. To know that all that you are doing will not go in vain. But many of us are lacking wisdom. We all exercise foolishness. Think it is wisdom. Remember, there are two kinds of wisdom. Wisdom from above and wisdom of the world. The wisdom of the world is where you begin to see people begin to gossip, begin to fight forth, begin to be jealous against each other. But wisdom from heaven is pure. Pure. God's people... It, God wants us to move from where we are to a new level. That's why he said, how to build up life and future. Many people have missed their mark today, or the mark of God, because they don't know how to exercise prudence in the things that God has assigned to their lives. The third division, how to fulfill the course of your life. How can we fulfill the plan of God in our lives? How can we fulfill it? By walking in the right place. Walking in the right place brings joy and fulfillment. Being at the right place at the right time. Doing the right thing. When you are in the right place, 
Doing the right thing, there will be joy and sense of fulfillment. Yes. Secondly, for you to fulfill the course of your life, you must learn to obey the word of God for your life and counting on God's faithfulness. You must learn to obey every word that God has spoken to you. Don't listen to heresies. Don't listen to what people have suggestion of man without the guiding of the spirit. Obey the word of God. What did God say? A minute step of obedience will open for you a gigantic door of blessings. A minor step of obedience. Take a step of faith. Every step of faith of obedience will bring and shower in abundant blessings upon your life. Then you begin to tap on God's, because when you're obedient, you begin to tap from God's faithfulness. The Bible told us in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter, two, chapter 5, verse 24, that faithful is God who called you and he will do all that he has called you to do. Faithful is him who called you for he will do it. He will accomplish all that he has spoken to you. Our problem today is this. We always think that if God has called us for a particular task, there will be no problem. It will go smoothly. Church, listen. Devil is not your friend. He's your enemy. How can he keep quiet and let you sail through? He must come and attack. The Bible says he's like a roaring lion. He must make noise to see if you will abandon and run away. Then he'll, lie and he'll, he'll, he'll just sit back and say, Christiana. Yeah. This is exactly what it is. He will laugh at you. The same thing in the book of Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. The Bible says, God who began a good thing will not leave it unfinished. He will continue it. Press on. Even if everyone abandons you, stay put where you are. Will you abandon God because everyone has abandoned him? That's a question. Will you deny God because everyone has, ad has denied him? Remember the man, like Elijah, who refused to bow down or to fall evil ways. Remember Daniel, the prophet. Remember Abednego, Shadrach, and Meshach. They refuse. They keep on pressing on. Thirdly, for you to fulfill the cause of God upon your life, you must learn to press forward, not considering the past failures and defeats. You must press forward. Don't consider the past failures and defeat. Apostle Paul, when he was writing to the church of Philippians, in the book of Philippians chapter 3, a moment, look at what it says in verses 13 and 14. Brethren, I do not come myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press forward. I press toward the goal for the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Look at what it says. I don't consider myself to have apprehended, he says, but there's one thing that he pressed forward. Pressed towards the goal of high calling. You must forget about the past of your life. That is why in the book of Acts, chapter 26, verse 19, Apostle Paul told King Agrippa, he said, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Will you be disobedient to the heavenly vision? Acts 26, 19. He declared in his testimony, Oh, king, I did not, and I will not be disobedient to heavenly vision. Will you be disobedient to heavenly vision? Will you be disobedient to what God has called you to do just because people are finding fault with you, just because people whack you, just because people talk about you? Now, the question is, if they don't talk about you, who will they talk about? Talk about me. They have to talk about you. You cannot take it. Who take it? It's your problem. You want to throw in the towel because you feel that I cannot stand this anymore. They did this, they did that. That is not the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is a mind of consistency. The mind of Christ is a mind of faithfulness. 
the mind of Christ, the mind of perseverance. The mind of Christ, mind that withstands all attacks of the enemy. That's the mind of Christ. In the book of Luke chapter 9 verse 62, very clearly it is written. It says, no man having put his hand to the plow and look back is worthy of the kingdom. You're not worthy. So when you begin to look back, you're not worthy of the calling of God upon your life. You have this own God. I would like us to read that. I like to read that because it's one of the verses that keep me going. In chapter 9 of Luke, look at verse 62. And Jesus said to him, No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. You are not. And many times we use all kinds of slogans. No, God understands. God knows. Well, God knows that you have put your hand and you're looking back. That's what God knows. Nothing else. God knows that you have backslided. God knows that you have quit your God post. That's what he knows. So that, there's no slogan or phrase you will use to change that course. God knows. That's what God knows. God knows that you are no more at a God post. God knows that you are no more doing what you're supposed to be doing. Fourthly, for you to fulfill the course of God upon your life, that will come by understanding, the, understanding that every course of our lives need divine direction. You must always know that every step you take requires divine direction. That is why in the book of Proverbs, chapter 14, verse 12, the Bible said, there is a way that seems to be good unto a man, but the end of that way is death. There's a way that seems good in your eyes. Oh, what I'm doing is nice. Oh, what I'm doing is good, but that's not the word of God. The end of it is death. So you must understand every step you take must be ordered by God. Everything you do must be in line with what he has called you to do. When you are in the, center of the God's, in the center of God's will, what happens? You open your mouth in prayer, God answers. When you bind, it's bound. When you lose, it's loose. Now listen carefully what happened today. Today I sent SMS to my friend in the U.S. who is suffering from cancer of the lungs. So when I sent the SMS, the wife replied me back and said that she is tired. That I should pray for her. That she is in a place where everything is falling apart. So I told her to call me immediately. Today in the office, she called me. I picked up the phone. I asked her what's going on. She told me the worst has come. That a man is no more talking. And now they're just waiting anything to happen. So... I told her to put her hand upon the husband's head immediately. They called the man for almost 20 times. The man didn't answer. So I said, put your hand upon that man's head now. He put, we rebuke the spirit. After praying less than five minutes, I said, call him. He called him, he answered. I said, pass him the phone. He passed the phone and the man spoke to me immediately. God's people, listen. You and I hold the balance of power. The problem with mankind is that we don't want to live right. We claim to be living right, but we are not. We know we are not, and our heart is not right with God. A little bit of thing, you get angry. As and when you like, you throw your weight because you feel you are Mr. or Miss somebody. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. The Bible wants us to be humble. The key to spiritual power is humility. Speak freely and speak truthfully. Don't try to manipulate words because I may not know, but he knows. Don't try to change, think that you're very wise, you're very intelligent, I can use any phrase and cover up what I want to say. You can cover it for me, I don't understand, but you cannot hide it from him. You must always remember this. This is very clear. You cannot hide it from him. He sees beyond any man. If you want God to fulfill that course of life of yours, this can come by not depending on the wisdom of the world, but by depending on the wisdom of God. So you must always depend on wisdom of God. In the book of James, James, the brother of Jesus, wrote it very beautifully. In the book of James chapter 3, 
Look at verse 17. What James wrote concerning the wisdom that we need to depend on. Wisdom. John, in James chapter 3 verse 17. It says, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Without partiality and without hypocrisy. Many times we say, wow, how come you always talk? Because I know my Redeemer lives. I cling on him. Left with me, I'm very weak, but he's strong. He that's in you is better than he that's in the world. God's people. If you want to really allow God to fulfill those things in your life, apply the wisdom from above. Wisdom from above. And any man, any woman who draw close to you, we know that you are a man or woman of God, a man or woman of prayer, a man or woman who fears nothing but God and loves nothing but God too. That you're a person who chooses to live for God in your words, in your actions, in your deeds, in every step you take. God's people. If God were to tell us to do what he knows that we cannot do, well, he's a tyrant. But God will not tell you to do what he knows. Whatever God wants us to do, he knows we can do them. Next, by trusting God with all our hearts. For God, for us to have this fulfillment of the course that God has put upon our lives, we must learn to trust him. The Bible made it clear in the book of Psalms 125 verses 1 and 2. It said, those who trust in the Lord will be like Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abides forever. And Jerusalem is surrounded by mountains, so the Lord surrounds his people now and forevermore. Isaiah the prophet declared that in the book of Isaiah, in his book, chapter 26, verse 3 and 4. You shall keep him in perfect peace, because he trusts in you, trusts you in Jehovah, for he is your everlasting strength. Woe to that man, that woman, who trusts in man, but we trust in Jehovah. That's where our help comes from. Next. If we have to have the will of God to be fulfilled in our lives, we must learn to believe God that he is able, faithful to fulfill his word. In the book of Romans chapter 10 verse 11, the Bible declared and said, those who believe in the Lord will not be put to shame. You will never be put to shame. Never. And also in the book of 2 Timothy, this will help you a lot. As you walk through the path of allowing God to fulfill his will in your life. 2 Timothy chapter 1, look at verse 12. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I, am, for I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. That whatever you have committed into the hands of the Lord through prayer... God is able to fulfill them. God is able to prove himself. That's what I always tell Lord. Sanctify yourself in this situation. Prove what made it to be God. You sit upon the throne. Show your strength in this situation. And God proves himself. God's people. Next. By acknowledging the omnipotence of our God. If you want that particular cause to be fulfilled in your life. You must learn to acknowledge the omnipotence of our God, always. What do we mean by omnipotence of our God? That our God is all-powerful. That there is nothing too hard for the Lord. Just as he spoke in the book of Genesis, chapter 18, verse 14, he said, Is anything too hard for me? Just as the Bible declared in the book of Luke, chapter 1, verse 37, it says, For with God all things are possible. Nothing is too hard. Our God is real. Our God is powerful. Our God does all that he chooses to do because he is our God. Next, for God to fulfill those calls upon your life, we must learn to accept wholeheartedly that God is not a liar. Our God is not a liar. He does not lie. In the book of Numbers, chapter 23, number 23, look at what it says in verse 19. Numbers 23, 
19, he says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? God is not a liar. Whatever God has spoken to come to pass. Never mind what man might try to paint, picture the paint. Our God is not a liar. He always proved himself. He always proved that he is God who sits upon the throne. And he always protect his own. Give his own water in the time of drought. Give his own food in the time of famine. Give his own light in the time of darkness. Give his own cloud to protect them from sunshine. That's our God. That is our God. Last but not the least, if we want God to fulfill his divine assignment upon our lives, that will be done by us embracing God with his unfailing word. Everything that God has spoken, you must embrace that word. The Bible told us in the book of Isaiah 55, look at verse 11. You must embrace this truth in every situation you are. Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I is pleased, and it shall prosper in, in the thing for which I send it. So shall it be. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, hold on to it. Hold on to it. It will not come back to God, void. Whatever God has spoken, God will fulfill it and it will accomplish everything God has proposed. Hold on to that. It does not matter how long it seems to be. Sometimes we say, ah, how long, how long? No, it doesn't matter. Just believe. Just believe. Hold on to it. The Bible made it clear. In the book of Isaiah chapter 7 verse 9, he said, if you don't believe, you will not be established. Second Chronicles chapter 20 verse 20, he said, if you believe, you shall be established. So you have to choose. If you believe, you'll be established. If you don't believe, you'll not be established. And finally, before we close tonight, I take it to the New Testament in the book of Philippians chapter 4, a moment. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. He says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. I say it. If you want God to build you up, your life and your future, whatever thing that is of good report, listen to them. Don't listen to false accusation. Don't listen to evil words. Don't listen to lies of the demons. Don't listen to things that are contrary to God's word. And you see your life will never be the same. That's why God has given us this word. And by dividing this topic into three divisions, how we can know and determine divine assignment for our lives, which will help us to build our future. How to stay focused and concentrated to divine direction. So when God is directing our steps, we must not be stumbling here and there as if we're in darkness and finding how to fulfill the course of our life that God has planned for our lives. Because every step of the righteous man is being ordered by God. And you know that God orders your steps. And God keeps you on. God wants to build up your life and your future. But well, God will lead you into the wilderness. But you are the one to decide when you come out of wilderness. Either it takes you 40 days, 40 years, 400 years. You have to decide. Remember, it took Jesus 40 days. But it took the people of Israel 40 years. So how long will it take you? It depends on what you have planned for your life. When you hear the voice of God, you're not hard in your heart.